In late November 2020, the Change or Suppression Conversion Practices Prohibition Bill 2020 was introduced to the Victorian Parliament. This bill, its implications and the speed with which the government pushed this bill through has caused many concerns for people. Today on Wilderness Conversations, we have a different format. Instead of a conversation, we have a monologue. What does this bill mean for people of faith? Welcome to Wilderness Conversations. Please note that my opinions that I share are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice on any subject matter. Please do not act or refrain from acting on the basis of what I say. I'm making comment, but I'd like you to make up your own mind. And if, of course, you're accused of falling foul of a legislation such as this, you should seek legal or professional advice. The Change or Suppression Conversion Practices Prohibition Bill 2020 was introduced into the Victorian Parliament in late November. It's designed to address the negative impact of what's called gay conversion therapy. The bill follows recent legislation in Queensland and the ACT for similar purposes, but this particular bill is by far the most dramatic. There is no doubt that the bill is designed to protect vulnerable people from outdated practices that were somewhat common in years gone by, for which we have no argument. We oppose those practices, some of which were nothing more than barbaric, and we would support those individuals who have been harmed through that sort of therapy. Having said that, it is the extent to which the legislation goes that is of great concern to us. And it's important that anyone who's engaged in Bible study, Bible teaching, Sunday school teaching, pastoral care, They need to be aware of this legislation, even if you're not living in Victoria, as we'll discuss. The bill establishes a civil response scheme within the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. It's called the Commission. This commission has powers to consider and resolve allegations of change or suppression practices, and it has powers to investigate, to seize documents, and to enforce this prohibition. The bill creates new criminal offences relating to change or suppression practices, and these offences apply to persons who engage in forms of change or suppression practices which cause injury or serious injury to persons, or persons who advertise change or suppression practices, and persons who take other persons from Victoria for the purpose of change or suppression practice. The Act has stated objectives. The first objective is and I quote, to eliminate so far as possible the occurrence of change or suppression practices in Victoria. The third bullet point is to ensure that all people, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, feel welcome and valued in Victoria and are able to live authentically with pride. This is in keeping with the subtle but very definitive direction of modern thinking. Tolerance is not the objective. Acceptance is. In fact, if I quote Daniel Andrews, it's not even acceptance. It's what he calls celebration. He says you'll stop nothing short of achieving celebration of the LGBTQI lifestyle, and that's his goal. The intention of the act is stated, and among other things, as to affirm that a person's sexual orientation or gender identity is not broken, in need of fixing, and to affirm that no sexual orientation or gender identity constitutes a disorder, disease, illness, deficiency or shortcoming, and to affirm that change or suppression practices are deceptive and harmful to both the person subject to the change or suppression practices and the community as a whole. The intention of the Act is stated among other things as to affirm that a person's sexual orientation or gender identity is not broken and in need of fixing, and to affirm that no sexual orientation or gender identity constitutes a disorder, disease, illness, deficiency, or shortcoming, and to affirm that change or suppression practices are deceptive and harmful both to the person subject to the change or suppression and to the community as a whole. Well, what is a change 
or suppression practice? I'm glad you asked, because Section 5 is entitled Meaning of Change or Suppression Practice. Point number one states, In this Act, a change or suppression practice means a practice or conduct directed towards a person, whether with or without the person's consent. That's the first point. In other words, even if this particular person is seeking for advice, is asking for help, is looking for counsel, if it's with their consent, the activity is potentially illegal nonetheless. Well, what sort of activities are illegal? Section 5-3 is entitled, A practice includes but is not limited to the following. A. Providing a psychiatry or psychotherapy consultation, treatment or therapy or any other similar consultation, treatment or therapy. It's very broad. It basically means you can't provide counsel. B. Carrying out a religious practice, including but not limited to a prayer-based practice, a deliverance practice or an exorcism. And C giving a person a referral for the purposes of a change or suppression practice being directed towards the person. So just to be clear, if someone comes to you seeking for guidance in the matter of, say, same-sex attraction, and you provide some sort of consultation, or you pass them on to someone else for consultation, or you support them in a religious service like prayer, you've potentially broken the law. If you're not a Victorian, you may well be thinking, well, this doesn't apply to me. Well, think again, and I quote, A practice or conduct may be directed towards a person remotely, including online or in person. So if you're living in Sydney and someone from Melbourne called you on the mobile phone and asked for advice, you could well find yourself in breach of this legislation. So if you're living in Sydney and someone from Melbourne called you on the mobile phone and asked for advice, you could well find yourself in breach of this legislation. The next section includes a detailed explanation of extraterritorial application. In other words, how the Act could apply outside of the Territory of Victoria. And the section includes, and I quote, For the purposes of subsection 1, there is a real and substantial link with Victoria if a significant part of the conduct occurs in Victoria or the conduct occurs wholly outside of Victoria, but the effects of the conduct occurred wholly or partly in Victoria. So that would include something as simple as a phone conversation. Well, what are the penalties? In short, under the reforms, anyone found trying to suppress or change another person's sexuality or gender identity faces up to 10 years jail or fines of almost $10,000 if it can be demonstrated that their actions caused injury or serious injury. Paragraph 10 details the three conditions that need to be met in order for a practice to be illegal under this Act. In order for behaviour to amount to a change or suppression practice that's illegal, there needs to be these three conditions. Number one, it needs to be directed to an individual. Number two, the action must be attempting to change or suppress or induce that person to change or suppress their sexual orientation or gender identity. Three, the action must cause injury or serious injury. Point two has been defined and includes things like counsel, suggesting counsel and prayer. Point three requires injury, and that's defined by the Crimes Act of 1958. And I quote, injury means A, physical injury, or B, harm to mental health, whether temporary or permanent. And that, of course, is a very low bar. The point to note, however, is point number one. This is significant. In order for a practice to be an offence, it needs to be directed, and I quote, to a person. In other words, the practice has to be directed towards an individual. Now, this is significant, and we need to understand this. My interpretation of this then, and I think it's pretty clear, that a lecture or a Bible study class, a general teaching, is not a change or suppression for the purposes of the bill, because such a talk or discussion is aimed at changing human behaviour, and because such activity is not directed towards a particular individual. So these activities would not be captured by this bill. 
And similarly, a prayer in a church service or an ecclesial service is not a change and suppression practice if it's not directed at an individual. Now, it's worth noting, of course, that by contrast, if we hold a prayer meeting or we do some counselling or we hold even hold a Bible study, it may well be prohibited if it's aimed at or convened because of a particular individual. There is a glaring hole in the legislation. It's an area of ambiguity is probably a better way of saying it, and that is the question over recommendation for celibacy. In other words, if a person of same-sex orientation seeks advice as to what would be an acceptable way of life for them before the Eternal Father, and you did not seek to change that person's sexual orientation, but you recommended celibacy, is that suppression? Is that a suppression of that person's sexual identity? Is recommending celibacy a suppressing practice? Would that be counsel? Would that be illegal? Now, this appears to be an unresolved issue. And this was evident on the evening of the passing of the bill in the Victorian Upper House when the bill was debated. Mr David Limbrick of the Liberal Democrats, the sitting member for the seat of South Eastern Metropolitan in the Victorian State Parliament, asked some pertinent questions of the Victorian Attorney General Jacqueline Symes. And I quote Mr Limbrick's question. He said, In Clause 5.1b, where it refers to, for the purpose of, 1 changing or suppressing the sexual orientation or gender identity of the person, one thing I would like to clarify that has been put to me and is of concern to a number of organisations. I would like to get the attorney's thoughts on this. Is encouraging someone to remain celebrant suppression? Assuming that it meets the other criteria for coming under this Act, is encouraging celibacy, so accepting their sexuality... So we're not rejecting that they are same-sex attracted or anything like that. So we are accepting that they are same-sex attracted, but we encourage them to remain celebrant. The Attorney General, Mrs Symes, responded, The short answer is no, not if it's taught regardless of sexuality. Developing the question a bit further, Mr Limbrick said, My understanding is under Islam it is an obligation to provide direct advice. And so they're concerned that they said was that they do not see people as broken or ill or anything like that, but that they have an obligation when someone says that they are same-sex attracted to tell them not to engage in same-sex practices. They are not denying their sexual orientation. Can the Attorney General confirm that they would not be caught by the definition and it would be safe for them to continue this practice? To that question, Mrs Symes responded, Without giving my personal views on telling someone what they should and should not do sexually, I would bring you back to the definition of a change or suppression practice. Telling someone not to engage in sexual activity does not offend the bill because it does not induce the person to change or suppress their sexual orientation or gender identity. If just simply the instruction is not to engage in sexual activity, that does not offend the bill. Mr Limbrick wasn't quite convinced, and then he said, Thank you, attorney. That does clarify it somewhat. Even if the intent of encouraging them to remain celebrant is because they are same-sex attracted, that still would not fall under the provisions of this bill. To which the response was, No. You could tell someone who is same-sex attracted not to have sex, or you could tell someone who is attracted to the opposite sex not to have sex and that would not offend this provision. This provision is only enacted if you are seeking to change that person's sexual orientation of who they want to have sex with. Now, this is a key point. If we can accept that this is the case, we can be somewhat relieved. But why doesn't the legislation state that clearly? It's ambiguous. Well, I think we can surmise the answer. And if it isn't obvious to you already, let me spell it out. It is the intention of supporters of this bill to make such moralising, as they would call it, illegal. But if they said as much, if the bill was that overt, the bill would not have passed. It would have been a step too far. In fact, during the debate, Ms Symes, the Attorney-General, said in her speech, and I quote, I would acknowledge that for some, 
this bill does not go far enough. It does nothing to prevent telling gay people they are broken. It does not stop anyone telling them they are sinners or that they should be ashamed or worse. In a sense, I'm sorry that it does not do this, but I hope this bill does send a message that these views are wrong. And of course, the vast majority of Victorians agree. So now it will be left up to the courts to ultimately decide if encouraging them to be celebrant is a suppression practice. I will be surprised if it turns out that teaching, prayer or counselling directed at a person of same-sex attraction, encouraging them to be celebrant, that is refrain from intimate relations, is not a practice eventually banned by this bill or some addition to it. But we'll see. A Christian group called Eternity asked the Office of the Commissioner for LGBTIQ communities about prayer in general and received the following response. Praying in general terms will not engage this law. In short, you can pray for a person, but not at them or over them. They said that we take that to mean that prayer directed at getting an individual to change is a change and suppression practice. But when we asked about praying in general terms, that LGBTQ persons might change or be celebrant, Eternity was told, if general prayer is reported to the Commission, the Commission would not be required or empowered to do anything as this is not a change or suppression practice. The Commission would decline to consider the report. Again, we wait and watch this space. There is another glaring omission in the bill, and I'm sure every parent is wondering. Where does this leave parents? Well, the short answer is nowhere. Parents are subject to this bill along with everybody else. So let me be clear. If you as a parent seek to change or suppress your 10-year-old, 12-year-old or 16-year-old, you're liable under this Act. There's no exemptions for parents. It's extraordinary, isn't it? This bill seeks to address what could be and potentially what were harmful practices. But there's definitely an overreach in this legislation. And in my opinion, it overreaches in two key areas. The first one is the relationship between suppressing sexual orientation and celibacy. We've just spoken about it to some extent. As mentioned, it's not clear if encouraging celibacy is legal. But what we are left in no doubt about is that the legislation prohibits face-to-face -face prayer with an individual to suppress a sexual orientation. So if a same-sex attracted person who comes to a pastor or to a Christian friend or even to another person in the same position that they're in, the same situation, for prayer and support, seeking help, they would not legally be able to help them, even if they were asked. And this is a gross overreach. The other area is almost at the end of the legislation. It's in paragraph 64 and it's entitled Amendment of the Family Violence Protection Act 2008. It's an insert of another example of what is to be considered emotional or psychological abuse. The example is as follows. An adult child repeatedly denigrating an elderly parent's sexual orientation, including by telling them it is wrong to be same-sex attracted and that they must change or the adult child will no longer support them. This at first glance might seem like a particularly odd and remote example. So why of all examples would you include that? Well, the key is, and I quote, it's an example. In other words, it clearly teaches that no member of a family can refuse to support another member of a family on the basis of their sexual orientation. This would be considered to be abuse. Now, this is not my interpretation. I quote from the Age newspaper in an article that is broadly supportive of the legislation, December 5, 2020 at 11.30pm. And I quote, In another significant move, the Family Violence Protection Act will be amended to clarify that suppressing or changing a family member's sexuality or gender identity is a form of domestic violence, empowering people to take action against their relatives. The regime governing personal safety Intervention orders will also be strengthened to prevent harassment on that basis. Parents come to mind, don't they? As a result of this legislation, it would be illegal for a parent to 
uh, put pressure on a child with regard to their sexual orientation or gender identity. This should be of concern to parents who believe they have a responsibility to guide their children in matters of gender and intimate relationships. Where to from here? We know that we have an obligation to serve God rather than be dictated to by such legislation. And the Apostle Paul considered himself innocent of the blood of all because he proclaimed the whole counsel of God, Acts 20 verse 26. And so we are obliged to teach and preach the things that God's revealed to us and to do so in the spirit of love and truth. The example of Daniel comes to mind. Daniel, despite a change of legislation, insisted on continuing his devotions. And we know the story. I don't think we should deliberately challenge this law, or if you like, poke the bear. I think, at least for now, there's enough room for us to go about our care for each other and with a balance of thought and wisdom, steer a course through the the changing landscape. Of course, that's for now. Having said that, I think we'd probably be naive to think that this will not progress to a point where our biblical position will be seriously challenged. In the meantime, we should continue to proclaim and preach the the word of God and to live out so far as we can the gospel of Christ, which has been entrusted to us. There's just one last thing that I think is worth considering. There has been examples in the past where legislation has been enacted designed to prevent harm or stop practices that should never have been accepted, practices that should never have been in the Christian community. I think we should have the courage to see that this may well be another occasion. There have been historical change practices and many conversion practices, like shock treatment or aversion therapy, that really were totally unacceptable. We could well ask ourselves, have we ever been guilty of creating burdens on fellow sons of God because of sexual orientation. Now, I'm not talking about same-sex behaviour, which clearly is wrong. I'm talking about orientation. Has there ever been a time when Christians have left a community to avoid fellowship with these individuals or ask these individuals to leave? Imagine the hurt. We could even be careless and say to an older young person something like, come on, when are you getting married? All meant in good humour, of course, but who knows? How well do we actually know each other? How well are we really supporting each other? What about our focus on some sins but not others? Do we focus on some sins more than others? I think that is a real question that we need to consider. As always, whilst we may not agree with the intentions of our secular politicians, especially when they overreach like in this legislation, they are presumably using their institutional power and privilege to actively protect vulnerable people from harm. And we have at least something similar in our charter. We need to be shepherds of the flock ourselves. This is Wilderness Conversations. (laughs) 